Political commentator Com Connor Tomlinson also joins me in the studio this afternoon. It sometimes feels a little bit like them versus us, doesn't it? Those who've got the connections, those who have power, able to make huge sums of money. And when things go wrong, it creates a bit of an ugly scene, like the Cameron Greensill uh, scandal. Yeah, it feels very much like the Etonian Boys Club are using their connections to get a leg up and uh, stash the monopoly money for themselves, as you put it. Now, obviously there's a distinction between the NGOs who really need to put forward a point of view and inform all of the MPs and whatnot on these issues when it comes to election time and uh, commons floor debate. So as much as we need to register uh, registration, and our prior guest was talking about that quite a lot, there are quite a lot of hoops to jump through Presently, um, I know working with a couple of NGOs how, how difficult it is to get past the Charity Commission, uh, for example. But there's a, a pretty di big distinction when voters are looking at how the politicians behave. And uh, as much as your prior guest said, we can't regulate those conversations. Um, I know John Penrose talks a lot about uh, having... So if you have a conversation about a particular lobbying issue with a senior... A civil servant or an MP, that has to go on record because presently they aren't. And there's a lot of parliament, uh, ex-MPs, for example, still using their parliamentary passes to go into parliament, have conversations by the back door, um, using them up to 100 times a year, and we don't know what they're talking about. So even though you've got that two-year gap, they can walk into parliament the day after they're out of office and, and talk to one of their mates about what should be done. So the picture isn't as clean and pretty as perhaps we'd like. I mean, do you think by and large in this country we're getting this right? Our regulation is a lot thinner than that in America. Uh, we have had a number of emerging uh, conflicts of interest or embarrassments, peccadilloes, scandals, whatever you want to call them, in recent, in recent months even, and particularly during the pandemic, when legislation perhaps had to be rushed through and decisions had to be made and contracts awarded and perhaps due process wasn't taken. Do you think overall uh, we handle this pretty well and the general public can sit back and think, I have confidence in my government and the processes, or are there lessons to be learned? Well, I don't think the general public presently has confidence at all. I mean, if you mm. look at YouGov and the situation behind YouGov is quite interesting because obviously the vaccine minister set that up and then people wonder why every single poll relating to the lockdown, they're very positive. But if you look at the YouGov polls on it, shortly after the Green Seal scandal, 60% of people, and this was cross-party, there's about a 10% gap, but that's still 60% of the Tories, said they shouldn't be doing anything like this. Cameron, Boris getting these holidays and the flat renovations. Technically, if they're not breaking ministerial code, that they won't be on the hook for it, but there's still something morally, uh, there's a gut discomfort with the voter base, and, and politicians should be very careful about that. And there's also the issue of, as you said, we've let the rules be a little bit lax during crisis scenarios. I know Matt Hancock was on the hook for his undisclosed uh, billions of COVID contracts, and essentially waved that away and said, oh, there's not much of a legal challenge here because uh, that was pretty much the practice that things were sloppy because we were in a crisis scenario. The issue is, if you say we can be lax with the rules during a crisis scenario, people are going to claim crisis scenarios all the time. Have we got a particular problem perhaps now with this government? You're talking about old Etonians and the same sort of people in these networks, earning money, getting contracts, uh, scratching each other's backs. Or is this sort of thing, I mean, it's, it's natural, isn't it, in life that if you know someone, you pick up the phone to them. I mean, I frankly do it quite often. Sometimes when I'm thinking about the guests I want on this program, I'll think, oh, I know such and such. It would be a great speaker on this. And I might send them a text message. That's how life works. Yes, but the issue is if you're trying to secure taxpayer funds, particularly as with the Green Seal example, uh, that you have a monopoly on the state. Uh, the state has a monopoly on force in, in that scenario, and they have access to things we don't have, and seemingly they're insulated from consequence as well. And well, not everyone thinks that because clearly Rishi Sunak didn't decide to pick up David Cameron's phone and, uh, and go along with it. He seemed very aware of the optics of the situation. And as much as your prior guest was saying there's no whining and dining, when David Cameron literally sets up a drink with Matt Hancock, Rishi Sunak and Lex Greensill, I would say that classifies as, as, as whining and dining personally. <laughs> Indeed. Well, Connor, thank you for coming in uh, and giving us your thoughts and your commentary on this. Very, very valuable insight. I really appreciate it.